Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast interviewing documentary filmmakers. I'm Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival, coming up in September, and artistic director of Doc NYC that happens in November. On this episode, I talk to the author Jonathan Safran Four and filmmaker Christopher Quinn about their new film, Eating Animals. Jonathan is best known for his novels, including Everything is Illuminated and Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close. But nine years ago, he published a work of nonfiction called Eating Animals that mixes personal reflection with an investigation into factory farming. The goal of the book was not to inspire anybody to eat in any particular way, but to inspire as many people as possible to engage with the subject, to find a language that was inviting rather than off-putting for something that I think everybody cares about and wants to feel good about, whatever your decision is. In the film, inspired by the book, we meet whistleblowers in the factory system and farmers who are striving to raise animals in a more humane way. The film follows characters over several months to experience their struggles, setbacks, and achievements. Jonathan doesn't appear in the film, but we hear occasional bits of his writing, voiced by Natalie Portman. I finally learned why drugs are so essential to factory farming poultry. Healthy birds don't require drugs. Sick mutated ones do. Turkeys have been so genetically altered that they're no longer even capable of having sex. They're all artificially inseminated. I learned that because corporations want to pay less for feed, and Americans like the taste of fat, today's meat birds have been bred with mutant obese genes to grow faster and fatter than ever imaginable before. So much faster and fatter that if a human baby had her growth similarly accelerated, a two-month-old would weigh more than 600 pounds. Director Christopher Quinn previously made God Grew Tired of Us in collaboration with Tommy Walker. That film covered the Lost Boys of the Sudan and won the jury and audience prizes at the Sundance Film Festival. Christopher says he came to eating animals as someone who didn't think that much about cutting back on meat. You know, it's very easy to kind of just roll with it. Uh, And it's a system that's in place, not only because it's delicious, but it's also that there's a lot of money that's spent to divorce us from where our food comes from. In our conversation, Jonathan and Christopher discuss the memorable characters they met on their journey. You'll hear Jonathan politely challenge me on my own eating habits, and he recalls a talk he had with Anthony Bourdain. When we began our discussion, Jonathan made clear that he still has mixed feelings after years of working on this topic. I'm still finding my way. I, I assume I will be finding my way for the rest of my life. And it's, I, I'm surprised by that. I'm also surprised by how strong some of my internal contradictions are. Mm-hmm. You know, my desire, the desire I sometimes feel to just kind of pound my fist on the table and say, this is wrong, wrong, wrong. We cannot do that. Nobody should do that. I don't know why we're talking about it like this when we should be talking about it like murder. And then there's another part of me that feels um, very, very differently, that feels like, hey, there's actually nothing wrong with eating meat per se. There's something very wrong with the system that we have. And we need, it may not be possible to change the system, given how many people there are on the planet. It changes the system in a way that allows people to eat the amounts of meat they currently eat. Um, You know, if I spent, let's say, I've been an on and off vegetarian since I was nine. I spent about two or three years researching and writing the book. I spent about two years pretty actively talking about the book on campuses and radio interviews like this, bookstores. And the most fundamental question at the bottom of the book, is it right or wrong to eat animals, is one I still don't feel I have a good answer for, or I don't have a stable answer for. Um, All of that having been said, we do live in this particular world, not in a kind of, you know, philosophical experiment. And in this particular world where more than 99% of the animals that we eat come from factory farms, things become more clear and um, clear in a way that I think people can pretty broadly agree on. You know, even those who feel that animals are not to be 
eaten or used in any way, and those who feel that there's nothing in the world wrong with having a steak every night. Um, those are often posed as sort of the far ends of the spectrum of um, how to respond to the problem of meat, and they're really not. Like at one end of the spectrum is, or should be, factory farming is acceptable, and at the other end is factory farming is not acceptable. And I have found that you just don't meet people who think factory farming is acceptable, with the exception of the people who are profiting from it. In the film, we see that factory farming doesn't only exploit animals. There's also suffering among the contract farmers who are beholden to the mega corporations that run the food business. Craig Watts is a fourth generation poultry farmer in North Carolina. When he was in his 20s, the corporation Purdue Farms convinced him to expand his business by taking on debt. I went from two houses to four houses. My income did not double. My expenses more than double. It's just a treadmill of debt. Every contract's take it or leave it. You're half a million dollars in debt, you're gonna take it. It sucks, but you'll take it. I asked Christopher to describe how he connected with Craig Watts. Craig Watts was a contract farmer with Purdue, and um, he, we, you know, we tried for, I guess it was two years to find that person when nobody was really willing to come out and talk about it because the ramifications would be devastating, uh, which we saw with Craig's um, family, you know, when he opened his uh, factory farm doors to us and others. So he became he was a poultry farmer working uh, under contract with Purdue, and he became something of a, a whistleblower. Um, actually, I wasn't clear. Was his did his whistleblowing take place before you connected with him? So we put feelers out, and we uh, connected with a number of people. Compassion and World Farming, Leah Garcis was one that we had connected to, and. We knew that that was going to happen, that he made that decision. But he made that decision and opened up his doors to anybody. Uh, so uh, Nicholas Kristof from the New York Times ran a really compelling piece um, that started the Reddit boards moving, and the, he ended up getting you know millions of hit on his on his you know uh, YouTube video that he did. So it was we included that. That was part of the process of kind of exposing uh, factory farming for what it is and seeing what the fallout would be for the individual. You know, we see you and other people who are reporting on this uh, face a lot of barriers. Um, one that really struck me was something called the ag gag uh, laws. Um, can you describe what the ag gag laws are and uh, and how it affected your filming? Yeah, so ag gag laws are, are state laws. They're, uh, I would argue, constitutionally challenging. You, they basically say a guy like me who comes in with a camera cannot film. Well, if he does, he or she does film inside a factory farm, they can be prosecuted. And, it could, as, and it's as stiff as a felony. So like in Iowa, it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the law itself uh, makes it a felony. So these were really challenging uh, laws. They're being, um, there's a lot of people that are taking them on and successfully winning. But I mean, if you talk to anybody about these laws, people just almost become, you know, the slack jaw uh, that these laws are actually in place, that you, you can, somebody who has a camera can be prosecuted for exposing something that is wrong. And that becomes deeply problematic. Um, and then they made it a civil law in, in North Carolina. So we filmed a lot in North Carolina. And they made it a civil law that says basically if um, I film, uh, you know, the pink lagoons like you see in the film, that uh, the corporation or the farmer can come out and, uh, and sue me for uh, losses. So, but th they were so broad about the law that they actually made it so if you were in a um, you know nursing home and you filmed some sort of abuse that was taking place with you know in that mm -hmm. in that facility, the person who actually took the video to expose that could be sued. Mm -hmm. So it's a very the they're kind of the laws really bend what we consider right and wrong. I think, J Jonathan, I'm curious about what you've. Uh, confronted in uh, around the politics of this because th 
food seems like it should be an issue that affects everyone, shouldn't necessarily be a, a partisan issue. We all want good things to uh, feed our family. Um, so why do and how do politics become an issue here? How have they historically or how, how might? Well, in, in our contemporary times, for starters. Well, I think they're not, if you mean legislative politics, there, there's almost nothing um, that regulates the industry. I mean, there are laws in place that just aren't enforced in terms of like conversational interpersonal politics. Um, you know, I, I don't think that this is a political issue in the sense of um, one's attitude corresponding in any way to whether you're a Republican or Democrat or Northerner or Southerner or even urban or rural or age or race or religious background. Um, the you know values that are at the heart of it, it's a strange thing even to talk about in, in the present moment because this expression has kind of lost meaning, but they feel like um, fundamental values. Um, it's very hard to imagine the person who would be indifferent to, for example, keeping a pregnant animal in a cage so small that she can't turn around. Who is that person? You know, I, 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 I literally cannot conjure an image of that person in my mind, and I've yet to meet that person. Um, there are climate change deniers, and there are people who believe the science. Um, I don't know of anybody who is, and I cannot imagine the person who is indifferent to water pollution, you know, the pollution of the water that we drink and depend on, or air pollution. People well, exactly, and, and yet it's, it's somehow that doesn't translate legislatively. Well, so there are a couple of reasons why that might be the case. One is um, there's no access to information. There really, there really isn't. This is something that a lot of people have. In, I mean, I can speak as somebody who really did care about this, and I had no access to information before I started writing the book. I, had, I knew that something wasn't right, but I really didn't understand. I couldn't explain what wasn't right, and I, I had no sense of the, the breadth of what was wrong. The other thing, which is important to remember is we have a lot of incentives not to think about it. You know, meat tastes good and it smells good. And most of our associations with meat when we're not, you know, putting aside the kind of ethical questions about what farms are like and how animals are treated, almost all of our associations are really positive, like deeply positive and embedded in um, family culture, national culture, religious culture for some people. So I know what that's like too, personally, to not want to think about it um, and to wish, as I often still do, you know, years after having made my sort of personal decision, it's, it is a very regular event in my life that I wish I were eating meat you know, when, because it's simply as somebody across from me is eating something that looks appealing to me or it's like the 4th of July and there's a big barbecue. So I have a lot of sympathy for people who don't want to approach the subject. It, but, you know, it being difficult to approach is not a, is not, it, it might be um, an excuse for not digging in, but it's not a justification for not digging in. So I, I remember um, actually having a radio interview with uh, Anthony Bourdain a couple mm -hmm. years ago when the book came out, not that long after it came out. And we sort of, the, the conversation orbited around this question of like, how good is the good of pleasure? You know, um, does the fact, like where, where do we draw the line when something undeniably brings us pleasure in life? And when um, not only the, a kind of physical pleasure, but an interpersonal pleasure and, you know, exp being a, a good guest, being a good host, learning about other cultures, a lot of the things that he's now being celebrated for, which I think are really valuable and he deserves to be celebrated. But when you look at it in context other than meat, it suddenly becomes so much more clear, you know, like um, sexual pleasure, right? Um, that is not something that people are encouraged to pursue um, without any kind of ethical limitations, right? In fact, we all agree that ethical limitations should be pretty severe. Um, if we look at dishonesty, something that we've been talking about a lot over the last two years, um, 
it can often really facilitate life to lie. But nobody would say, okay, so that's a reason to lie to, at any occasion. So if we can somehow bring the conversation about meat just into the mainstream of our way of thinking about other ethical issues, that, yeah, there's something we want here. Yes, it's good, but come on. We're like earthlings. We're human beings. We're citizens of a country and a planet, and we can't just have whatever we want whenever we want it. It's odd that we've exempted this one subject from that mode that we that normally like um, dictates these conversations. So in the case of Anthony Bourdain, who's on our minds very much these days, where did you reach in your conversation with him, uh, g- given that he's someone who you know, made a living sticking meat in his mouth? Well, we like reached an agreement within, I don't know, two exchanges um, and then spent the rest of the conversation talking about why we need to move away from factory farming. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he is somebody who would say uh, and did say, you know, vegetarians. Uh, I mean, he, he had like great zingers about vegetarians. <laughs> you know, um, he would say vegetarians are like Hamas, basically. Not hummus, but Hamas. And uh, but if he if pushed, he would say, "Well, you know, what do you think of the factory farm industry? Well, that's that's the real enemy. Okay, so you think we should eat meat, but we shouldn't eat factory farm meat. Yes, that was his attitude. He was very forthright about that. And by the way, it's the attitude that most like public chefs and public foodies have. Um, so then we're talking about only eating meat that comes from small and family farms. We're talking about not eating meat that's sold in supermarkets. We're talking about not eating meat that's sold in most restaurants. We normally think that there's 100% disagreement between somebody like Anthony Mordain and somebody like Ingrid Newkirk, who runs PETA. In fact, there's a 1% disagreement. Mm. You know, 99% of the food we eat, the meat we eat, comes from factory farms. Anthony Mordain thinks we should not eat that 99%, but should eat the remaining 1%, Ingrid Newkirk thinks we shouldn't eat 100% of it. So it's a 1% disagreement. And if we can, like, any ways to bring the, the conversation back to the fact that it's a 1% disagreement and to highlight this broad, these broadly shared values, I think is really powerful. The film helps us understand that 1% of farmers who raise animals outside the factory system, Kansas farmer Frank Reese specializes in heritage chickens and turkeys. When I was a kid, there was a true love of the aesthetics. I would go and I would visit the farmers that I knew. When you would look out over the field and you would see a flock of bard rocks or you would see a flock of bourbon red turkeys, they would truly love the beauty of what they saw, of what they were doing. That is gone today in farming. There's no way you can love an animal that has been genetically engineered to die in six weeks. Christopher describes what he learned from Frank Reese. I think once you uh, get to his farm and actually spend some days there, I don't know about you, Jonathan, but I I was all of a sudden uh, challenged about what I thought how animals could be raised, that interaction. And Frank's animals, as you see in the film, at one moment are literally, he's leading thousands of turkeys that are following him. Um, And their relationship was, is very complex. And there are people that I think Ingrid would, would challenge that this relationship, animal husbandry is, is bad, but um that became uh, an eye opener for me that that relationship and and how they coexist and then more importantly frank has these rarefied genes you know these heritage breeds his turkeys have been on the same farm for 102 years and they have uh all the things that we need if we're going to eat animals if we continue to eat animals we're going to need those genetics someday because the genetics that you see on the other side, the 99% that Jonathan was just remarking on, have been hibernized to such a, a, a level that they're starting to fail. And uh, here's a guy in the middle of America with all the precious genetics we need. And this relates in like, when you look at uh, something like avian flu, or if you look at, um, you know, his animals, 
uh, interact with wild birds or feral birds right away. And so they have that relationship and they build an immunity based on that. Well, in, inside the, you know, the, the factory farms, there is no immunity. So we artificially have to support these animals that are going to die in 40 days as opposed to four months on Frank's farms. So these are really significant things that really kind of changed the way that I, when I first came to the film and uh, met Jonathan and Natalie, and, and I said, I think you might have the wrong guy. I'm a, you know, I like, I was more like a, you know, I was like to travel and I made films all around the, you know, the planet and I like to eat, not unlike Anthony Bourdain. It was exciting to be able to go to all these places. But um, it really changed the way that I look at eating animals to the point where I think happily, you know, we were just in San Francisco and I ate some of Frank's chicken at uh, you know, Chez Panisse. Alice Waters made a nice meal out of it and I was happy to celebrate with Frank on the other side of the table. And that really um, mattered to me and it was significant. But when will I eat turkey or chicken again? It'll, it'll probably be a very long time. And I've made that decision for a number of reasons. Um, and Jonathan talks about those reasons in the book, and, and we, talk, we see them in the, in the film, but I think everybody has to draw their own conclusions. But mine is, I can't support a system like this. It's so fundamentally different from, you know, where you want to go with your family and what you're going to leave behind. And when you look at the system, I think you're really going to alter. It, it challenges you, as you were saying earlier, Jonathan. That I don't. I, you're hard pressed to find anybody who can say that this is okay. So, when I watch the film and I look at Frank's chickens, I think, yes, that's what I would like to feed my family if we we're going to, you know, eat meat. And we do eat a lot of meat um, uh, in our house. Uh, I feel self conscious to say after watching this film. And yet it's not that easy to do. Uh, when I go to the supermarket, like most people, uh, you know, I'll look out for the organic labels as if that's some kind of salve to my conscience. Jonathan, uh, you write in, in the book that a lot of that terminology, organic, free range, is largely bullshit. Yeah, it is. I mean, a lot of it is not not only bullshit has literally no meaning, you know, like uh, terms that are not defined or in any way regulated. Um, and I, a lot of people f have this, these like uh, instincts that you have in a supermarket wanting to find something that's a little bit better because you're going to eat meat. That's just a reality. And, um, or it's a reality for now in any case. And but you also care and you want to do it better. So I think it 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 is definitely the case that if you can buy it from a farmer that you've met, you know, who's um, who you are capable of having a conversation with and who in most cases, if you can meet a farmer, they would be happy enough to take you to their farm and show you how things work. That's great. But that's not possible for a lot of people. It's or not available at my Acme supermarket. <laughs> um, I think the secret is to eat less. You know, it's it's not a binary. It's not that you have to say my family eats a lot of meat or my family's vegetarian. Um, let's let's take your family right now. Like, you think you eat meat every night? Probably yes. Okay. We've tried to do like a meatless Monday, uh, you know, kind of thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. How about for lunch? How often do you guys eat meat? Uh, most days. Could you conceive of? having it for dinner every night, but not having it for lunch? Absolutely, yeah. So no, that, that would be I mean, a massive difference yeah, yeah. in terms of like your impact on animal welfare and the environment. You know, people, Christopher and I have talked about this before. If the question is, can we imagine half of Americans being vegetarian in 10 years? I think it's impossible to imagine. But can you imagine half of the meals in America being vegetarian in 10 years? I really can imagine that. I think there's not, not only many people, I think most people want to do something. They want to engage with the subject. They want to make a difference, but they can't change in a kind of binary or ultimate way. I'm curious to hear from either of you, you know, some of the social habits that you've cultivated or strategies to, 
you know, to live a more ethical lifestyle um, as you fe- see fit. I was just thinking last night I was at a nice restaurant uh, with this film very much in my mind, feeling like determined to have a, you know, meatless night. There wasn't, you know, any real offer, um, you know, at the Grand Tier Restaurant Lincoln Center to uh, to, to go meatless. Um, well, so in a way you answered your own question. So you went to a nice restaurant, right? If people only ate meat when they went to nice restaurants or when they were having a familial celebration or a holiday um, and they didn't eat it when it was from, you know, a food truck or when it was like a turkey sandwich picked up in an airport, then we could solve this problem. Um, I often, when somebody, you know, wants to have this conversation, one of the one of the the ways we have it is I will say, you know, how often, if you're being honest with yourself, like how often does meat matter to you? So I would say going to a nice restaurant might be a case where it matters to you. Um, all holidays put together, birthdays, July 4th, Thanksgiving, Christmas, um, every time you go to someone's house and they prepare meat for you. you, know, if, you if you were to add those up, when, when you feel like it's making a, a significant difference in your life, what do you think the number would be over the course of a month, let's say? Let's say you have around about 100 meals in a month. How many of those meals do you think are significantly better because you're eating meat? Ten? Sure. When you talk about it that way, you ten or so. see a lot of change that you could make. Yeah. So like if you say, oh, yeah, I'm going to put those ten aside. Like I'm going to go to the restaurant. I'm going to get the meat because it's going to be great and delicious and that's important to me. And we're going to do the holidays because they're important to me. But I'm not going to go down the street and get something I don't even like. That, you know, so much of meat consumption is you don't even like it. It's not even offering any real pleasure. Mm. Um, if we just got rid of those things. I would think like half of the meals, at least half of the meals eaten in the country would be different. And that would get us a very, very far away. So, uh, Christopher, is you've started to bring this film out into the world at film festivals and uh, and so forth. You know, what kind of reactions have you seen? Uh, we just came back from Europe. We were showing the film over there uh, and it's overwhelming. There, we have the advantage of uh, people who have read the book. You know, it's it's it spread throughout uh, Europe and in the world. So there were people who come eager to to see the film version. The two works are very different, but I think I like to think that they complement each other. And people have been um, it's it's been a very young crowd, and this is something that they really uh, want to engage and have the conversation about, at least in Europe. And then we've been in Denver and California and uh, other places, and as the film rolls out, it's a real question that's on everyone's mind. And I think maybe a little bit at the root of it is we're kind of, we find ourselves in a place where there's, uh, not to get too heady about it, but there's, uh, you, you, we feel so disempowered in a lot of, in the information age and having, cell phones and everything and there's something to be said about this kind of in- incredible decision and this goes in hand with what Jonathan was saying uh, that you can make these decisions just to opt out of not putting meat at the center of your plate for every meal and that to me seems uh, rewarding for myself but I think people want to have that discussion now because they feel overwhelmed about where their food comes from or overwhelmed where their news come from and they want um, a new story. They want to be able to latch on to something. And that's the big takeaway for me with the audience is that they're engaged enough to want to start to look to change. And if that does happen, I mean, it's really going to have, you know, real ramifications for what happens to our environment because you know this is the leading cause of climate change, the way that we raise our um, uh, meat, dairy, and eggs. And, and then it also has our own personal, you know, we've become you know, this morbidly obese and there's type two diabetes and this is all, there's a, there's a correlation here. And then there's also nobody, as, you know, as Jonathan points out in his book, I think it's 
people have issue with an animal suffering to get that uh, you know meal on on their plate. So these are issues that it's not that no matter what lens you look through on this issue, I think you can find something significant to latch on to and start this conversation. But you know it is difficult. There are people who you know it's very easy to kind of just roll with it. Uh, and it's a system that's in place, not only because it's delicious, as we were talking about earlier, but it's also that there's a lot of money that's spent to divorce us from where our food comes from. That's covered in, that's, I think that's from your book. You know, they, there's, a, there's an enormous amount of money that makes us to, to feel good about the system that's in place. But once you look under the hood, you really realize it's fundamentally different from how we kind of think or want to live our lives. Mm. Um, the the third creative partner in this who uh, narrates the film is Natalie Portman. Um, can you talk about how she got involved with this project? I've known her since 20 years ago, something like that, 25 years. And um, this subject has just been an ongoing, something we talk about as time, because you know, as I was saying earlier, it's not as if I reached some conclusion and then just went with it. It's, it's something I've wrestled with and continue to wrestle with. And I, I happen to like talking about it. It's one of the things Christopher just mentioned, which is a really good point, is this is not something that feels bad or is a diminishment only. There are things about the subject that are scary, it's violent, and it might require not doing things that feel good. But it's actually a really great conversation to have because it touches on things that we care about and it kind of like tickles our brains in interesting ways, but also that act of um, self-empowerment, of um, making, changing the way that you live so that you better resemble the person you want to be just feels really good. And like students know that better than the people sitting around this table, maybe because we've been, we've forgotten a little bit or jaded a little bit, but um, on high school campuses, college campuses, that kind of choosing to go against a mainstream that that um, doesn't seem to resemble you is really exciting. On American college campuses now, there are more vegetarians than Catholics. So it's not like a fringe you know, movement. This is something that's very, very much at the heart of what younger people, people in their teens and 20s are thinking about. Um, so anyway, Natalie and I would talk about it. And she knew I was writing the book, and I sent her a draft before I had published it or finished it. And when she read the draft, she was really moved by it and said this might make a nice documentary. And that was kind of the beginning of a conversation that took a lot of time um, because you know Christopher can testify to this obviously much better than I can. It's a really hard movie to make. It's, it's one thing for me when I was writing the book, I made a research visit, but I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of phone conversations. Christopher has to get in places and, you know, you can't just talk to someone. I mean, shows their, part of what's so powerful about the film are the, the kind of humane atmospherics, you know, looking at the face of the farmer, um, seeing those pink lagoons um, really was a case of like an image being worth a thousand words. We've mentioned the pink lagoons a couple of times. Can you describe, Christopher, what we're talking about when we say pink lagoons? Yeah, so the hog industry um, kind of migrated to North Carolina. So this is a, this is Eastern uh, Carolinas, which is, you know, I think the water table's at three, three feet, three to seven feet in this area. And uh, the, it's an area that they overtook this very, uh, it's a mainly, uh, you know, impoverished, poor, rural, African-American community. Um, and they ha lack the political clout, so in comes this, um, you know, the hog industry, which had moved from Virginia down to North Carolina, uh, you know, uh, specifically Smithfield and Murphy Brown. These are two big players that are in this area. And they just dig big ditches, and they put all of the... Uh, excrement, the pig shit, the urine, everything goes into this big, what they call pink lagoons. Um, and uh, Because the color of the water turns, has a pinkish look. Yeah. It, it, 
which in your film you have some overhead shots of uh, of, of these places. Yeah, and they're remarkable. They're at you know when you're way up high in a in a plane looking at them, they look like these pink postage stamps. And then when you get closer, they're really in enormous size. And they can do what they want with the, you know, they put it in the... That move from, that you described from Virginia, North Carolina, did that just have to do with laxer regulations in North Carolina? Yeah, that's what, it, I'm, you know, you know, there was political clout that stopped it from happening in Virginia. So they just migrated somewhere else. In fact, uh, Smithfield built a facility down in Brazil just to politically dangle in front of people to say, we'll, we'll be happy to move down to Brazil. So th they want to go where they can, you know, ha have zero regulations. And they found this place. And the Pink Lagoons exist. But as Jonathan points out in the book, there's, I think, some 400 microbes that you find in this, uh, you know, fecal soup. And there's a hundred man-made things that are in there. And all of this stuff gets either leached because there's no liners that are with these uh, pink lagoons. And so it goes into the water table and it starts to poison the water that people are drinking. But all, oftentimes they, it gets o overruns. So they just shoot the shit in the air. They literally have these high powered cannons that shoot and make it aerosol. They, and they're claiming that they're actually you know, fertilizing their crops. But this kind of runs into the tributaries and over the houses. I mean, literally, we filmed with somebody who house, they had to run inside because their house would get sprayed at a particular time during the day. So these are real problems. And, and like you say, it's a, you know, it, all you have to do is see this and uh, visually know that something's really wrong. And the color, the Pepto-Bismol color is the first indicator. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of negativity to focus on in this film and in what's happening today with uh, with the raising of animals in factory farms. Uh, but uh, Jonathan, in, in your book, you write that uh, in the three years it took you to write the book that you also – recognize a lot of positive uh, changes. And and I wonder in the nine years since you've written the book, if you see other positive trend lines. Well, I think there's reasons to be pessimistic. More people are eating meat than ever before. And um, if China and India take on American eating habits, then we'll have to double the amount of um, animals that we farm from 50 billion. You just, it's a really kind of interesting question. You just ask somebody, hey, how many animals do you think are farmed every year on planet Earth? Um, I've yet to meet a person who guesses more than 50 billion. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have to double that to 100 billion. Um, but the reasons to be optimistic are certainly the world is catching on to um, the environmental effects. You know, China has instituted new dietary guidelines where they're trying to reduce their meat consumption by half in about the next 10 years, only for environmental reasons. Um, and as I said, on you know, the real hope is the younger eaters in the high school and college campuses, and the idea that um, the norms will just flip. You know, on a college campus, I mean, when I went to college, and it's still the case, you go to the cafeteria, and there's a selection of options that include meat, and then there's the veggie option, right? Everybody's heard of that before, the veggie option. And I think we're moving toward. Um, country and hopefully a planet in which there will be a meat option. You know, it's not, the world is not going to go vegetarian anytime soon, but that really is easy to imagine. Um, so, you know, what's most inspiring, the world has a lot of problems right now. I don't think there's a problem that's bigger than this, um, but there are other big problems. The other big problems require us to elect new governments, require us to spend hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars um, might require us to somehow um, shift our ethical perspectives. This is a problem that only requires individuals to act on what they already believe. Um, and it's amazing to think about what would happen if we did. You know, We happen to have a ticking clock on this problem because we have, let's say, 20, 30 years to change the way that we um, relate to the environment or 
we will do damage that is irreparable. I mean, we have done damage that's irreparable, but we will really lose the planet. Um, this is the worst thing that we do to the environment. So we take the clock. If we're capable of pausing in supermarkets when we put food into our cart, pausing at restaurants when we decide what to order, we will literally be able to say we saved the world. Like our generation saved the future of human life. It's not an exaggeration. Um, I find thinking about that to be incredibly inspiring. It's a very happy thought, actually. I want to thank Jonathan Safran for and Christopher Quinn for joining me. Their film, Eating Animals, is now playing in theaters, distributed by Sundance Selects. Jonathan's book, Eating Animals, is in paperback from Back Bay Books. This interview was recorded at the School of Visual Arts in the MFA Social Documentary Department. Thanks to our team, series producer, Sarah Modo, sound mixer, Tom Micah, and web designer, Cross Strategy. Our theme music is composed by Andre Williams, and our executive producer is Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers, I invite you to listen to our short-form podcast, Documentary of the Week, from WNYC. You'll find over 160 documentary recommendations. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.